Tracy, uh, if you want to ask any questions or anything, feel free to use the chat like you just did. Um, it's not a problem. Um, keep working if you like. If not, no, no worries. Um, have a little cartoon here just uh, for humor. I like to throw these in occasionally. And, um, you know, there's the scenario in the classroom is sort of an exaggerated one, but since we're talking about communication and, and you know, the, the way our world is changing with regard to, to cell phones and the internet and technology and social media, um, and here obviously a, a student has texted the teacher while in class, uh, and, you know, the teacher is just saying, next time you could just raise your hand, you know, that a difference between, you know, that face-to-face -face communication versus that, that virtual communication. And, um, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit in the discussion boards this week that, um, or last week, that, that line of, you know, when is it appropriate to use email um, and online communication and when is it best to, to have that face-to-face -face conversation. And, and we can touch on some of those um, topics tonight as well. So again, thank you. Um, we'll start this evening, um, as we always like to at the JVLA, with, um, with just a prayer. Um, and for time purposes, I was going to do a the whole three-minute retreat. But um, uh, for tonight, since we do have a guest speaker and, and and all of that, and want to be sure that we get the most out of that time, um, we'll just start with it with an Our Father. Let's take a moment, bow our head. <clears throat> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so um, this week, uh, looking at our goals um, for this session, sort of first of first off looking at, um, you know, how do we communicate effectively um, online, just kind of touching up on some of the highlights or questions or thoughts that you had based on some of the material that you looked at last week um, and, you know, the discussions that we were having um, online on the discussion boards. And then our guest speaker, uh, Tim Riley, will be talking about uh, the strategies that he uses for implementing and assessing uh, discussion boards in his online classes. Um, we'll start with just brief introduction so we can all put, if we can, if, you're, if your mic is working, um, voices at least with, with names um, and kind of get, again, more of that personal connection. Um, I'll take a quick brief look just at the course structure. We did a lot of that just through the, the email and, and the introductory vid videos that I had you guys look at, but um, I'm just kind of going over that very briefly. Um, go over any questions or reflections that you've had about the last week. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Tim Riley will, will be here um, for the last three-fourths of it or so um, to, to share uh, his expertise with us this evening. All right, I'm going to go ahead and skip over this one for now. So we'll go ahead and start with introductions. Um, we can just go around name, school, subject area, um, or department, years teaching or in education, um, and any goals. Um, that you have specifically for this course. In other words, why why are you here? Um, so, any takers to go first? I'll start uh, since uh, you guys have been um, asked to uh, hear from me tonight. Tim Riley is my name. I have been teaching in uh, schools like yours for 30 years. I uh, was last at Seattle Prep, and uh, I. Took a sabbatical year last year. I've been back at school. I've been teaching with the JVLA for about three years, I guess. Um, my subject areas have been English and theology. And uh, so I have shared this uh, bioethics course that I had, a theology class with JVLA. And, uh, and that's gone well enough that uh, uh, I've, I've looked Seattle University and actually for the first time a college is going to kind of consort with JVLA and we're going to, I designed a class for them called Ignatian Discernment and we're going to launch that class this summer. So a uh, little bit of uh, building up of uh, this kind of an enterprise and I'm not going to go back to the full-time classroom. If I can make it work and buy groceries, I'm going to do a few other things and, and hopefully include uh, some online teaching. Um, so that's uh, my goals for this course. <laughs> If I can be of any use to anybody, I'd be grateful for you guys. Um, uh, kind of, uh, I've sure enjoyed the uh, tutorials that uh, Jasmine has set up for me. And uh, so that's me. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Next, Kimberly, you're well, it looks like I'm the only one who has <laughs> a microphone. 
Um, I'm Suzanne Russell. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am in my first year at Brebeuf Jesuit Preparatory School. Um, I am one of two uh, full-time librarians um, at the school. And let's see, I've been, been a librarian for 13 years. I was a stay-at-home wife and mother before that, so I kind of came to the party late. And I, my goal for this course is to just try to figure out how um, we can use some of this um, from the library. So the library to the students and then possibly helping teachers uh, learn about it too and learn how to implement it um, on their end. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. I think Kimberly's connected. I think I'm on audio. You are. So. Okay. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Kimberly Haig, and I teach at Regis Jesuit High School in Colorado. And we have two divisions. I teach in the girls' division, biology, honors biology, anatomy, and physiology. This is my fifth year at Regis Jesuit, but my 16th year teaching. And we are a one-on-one -on -one, um, school. For, for the first time this year. And so I am interested in different ways of integrating technology into the classroom that's meaningful and not distracting. And I try, I've tried a variety of different things. So I'm just, I look, I'm looking forward to learning more about blogging and just different ways of communicating with students and getting them engaged in the classroom. So I'm excited already just having watched the two videos that uh, Jasmine posted. So yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you. Um, and Jim, if you'd like, you can, yes, he's typing now. So um, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that, ladies. And I know, Kim, this is like your maybe third or fourth course with me, I feel like. Um, <laughs> it's maybe the third, yeah. Okay, great, good. So welcome back. Thank you. Um, definitely appreciate it. Um, so I'll give just a moment um, as Jim sort of shares a little bit. I'll give a little background on me So um, while we're there. Um, Jasmine Mendez, I'm with the JVLA. I used to teach English Lit, uh, Theater, and Speech. Um, last time, well, last place I taught was at Cristo Rey Jesuit here in Houston um, before moving to the JVLA. Um, but I do still teach some adjunct courses at the community college. Um, as well, just to kind of, you know, I don't like, I, I like, you know, I don't want to be those training of teachers that hasn't been in the classroom in forever. So I, um, I like to stay in the classroom and, and interact and um, and do some blended learning with with those students as well. Um, so yeah, and I live in Houston, Texas, and that's where I'm at. So and then uh, Jim says he's AP Chemistry, Integrated Science at St. Ignatius College Prep in Chicago. Uh, he's never used a back channel or blog before. But interested in pursuing ways to use to in the classroom. Excellent. Thank you. And I think, um, yes, Jim's uh, had some courses with us as well before. So welcome back and, and thank you for joining us. Um, there's a couple other folks, like I said earlier, I know Wilma said she was going to come, uh, but maybe a little bit later. So if she logs on, we'll have her uh, say hello. Moving right along uh, for time purposes, um, just wanted to share this was the the made a, a sort of a screen capture of this um, this morning. So if anything else was added um, after about 10 a.m., I'm sorry, it's not there. But um, I just kind of wanted to show and bring this up. This was the overall uh, chart that we had compiled as a group of the do's and don'ts of online communication. And I just wanted to take a moment or two um, and ask you all, was there anything um, from last week's um, readings and content that was either new to you or that reinforced something that you're already doing with regard to online communication? I think one of the main things I got out of the readings and um, participating is that I, I know what I want my students to do and I know what how I want to commu communicate with them, but I'm not sure that I'm clear enough with them. Like, for the assignment, I had, there's a few, like, 
isolated little pieces that I have in my syllabus and a few little things that I might say to them, but it wasn't all together in one little section that I now had have created that's communication. This is what I expect of you. This is what you can expect of me. And it's all in one spot. So I think that was helpful for me. That that was helpful for me. I liked that too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's interesting how much we take for granted that we sort of think or expect students to to know or, you know, in a way to decipher, um, you know, what our communication expectations are um, or that, oh, they use, you know, technology all the time, so they should know what the protocol is, but um, they don't <laughs> a lot of the time. And so it's, it's kind of up to us to be as explicit as possible. Um, you know, and I've found that when I have done completely online classes that you have to be, you have to really break things down and, and even though, like you said, it can really, even though it's clear to you, it may not be as clearly communicated to them or, or they perceive it in one way or, or a different, different way. So, good. Anything else about last week's information? I, um, this might seem kind of silly, but as I was reading some other things about online communication, I saw where some sources say that it's okay to use emoticons and some say it's not okay and so I was you know thinking about that especially from my perspective I could see why you know if you're responding to you know an English class or something like that you certainly wouldn't want to use that you want to be professional but in my case like for example if I did a book club or something like that it's a more casual environment and I think in that environment that it might be okay right. to use a smiley face or whatever um, because sometimes, you know, since you don't have that face-to-face -face and you, you can't hear the tone or see the facial expressions or whatever, that sometimes that, um, that little emoticon kind of helps clarify what somebody is saying. Mm -hmm. So I think that instead of making it a hard and fast don't, Mm -hmm. um, it they need to learn that um, you know when it's appropriate to be more casual in conversation versus being more professional. Right. Yes, I I completely agree. I, I think anyway. I don't know if other folks have other opinions, but I I'll, I think part of our job too is helping them discern right when it's appropriate um, to to use you know, that to use emoticons or certain types of, uh, I know what it's called, like texting language and, and that abbreviations and all of that kind of a thing, um, right. you know, and saying in, in this case, it's okay, you know, if you're responding to something related to classwork, not okay, that kind of a thing. It, yeah, definitely. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? All right. So, Again, because I want to respect everyone's time, I want to be sure we get the most of it, just sort of moving um, forward. So that was last week, just sort of general online communication, um, do's, don'ts, things that, that you're, you're learning about just with regard to overall general communication. Um, this week, we're looking at and focusing on discussion boards, um, which obviously we use a lot in this specific class because um, it's fully online and it's one of the, the, the ways that we communicate with each other and are able to, to discuss topics uh, asynchronously. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but, and I know this is really small, so um, you're welcome to, to open up the Google Doc if you like, and I'll go ahead and post the link here momentarily in the chat. Um, but I asked you all again, I pulled this up this morning, so if you've added anything, um, it's probably not there if you added anything after, after 10 a.m. this morning. Um, but sort of just, you know, we did the, the K and the W, so what you already know and then sort of what you want to know um, about discussion boards. And I know that, um, that Tim, our wonderful, lovely guest speaker, um, had responded to some of those questions um, already. Um, and so I guess from here, I'll just sort of let, let you take it away, Tim, and sort of talk about your uh, structure and, and, and background and all of that with regard to discussion boards. Um, and I can pull up the, your presentation, if you like, as well.
Jason, are you there? Tim? I don't know if we lost him or not. Can everybody else hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you also. <laughs> Just making sure I wasn't uh, the only one off. Okay, so I'll see. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe what a lonely feeling that <laughs> I'm here all by myself. Um, go quick here. Um, so, well, while he uh, either comes back on or I'm not sure quite what happened, he says he's online. I just can't hear him. Um, with regard to discussion boards, um, you know, who, how. Who has used them, and, and what are some of you know sort of the initial reactions or thoughts um, with regard to discussion boards with students? I've used I, it as a student. I used it with my students last year, and um, I did it where I had students play the role of a character, and they took like they took on the voice of that particular person. And uh, it was, they were really, really engaged. But I, ha I really didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, oh, let's try this. This will be different. And I, I know I didn't have very great questions. And mm -hmm. um, I only tried it the one time. And after like reading, I totally get how important questions are. And, um, but they were super engaged because they liked the, they're like, can we type in the accent of the character? And I said, See whatever works. <laughs> But um, the part that I'm still grappling with that I found frustrating was, I, I'll be honest, I have four classes of the same thing. And so that's about 100 students. And I did not want to read all everything they posted. And right. that's still where I'm at. How do I how do I do this? How do I assess this? How do I figure out what well, did they I, w I literally counted to see if they posted the minimum requirement. And I was like, great job. But I only spot read what they posted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah, that, that that does tend to be sometimes the why why people are put off by it because they just think there's no way I can mm -hmm. get through all of that. Um, others experiences. Just as a student, you can mm -hmm. only respond to to someone's post as well as they post, I think. Right. You know, and, and a lot of times people don't post very thoughtful, sometimes not even on target or on topic um, responses. You know, they're just trying to check that block off that they did the required postings. Right. right. I agree. And I found that with my students, too, that some of them would say, like, the five word sentence, they answer the question. But then I go back to, OK, I realize now how important questions are because my question may not have been open ended enough. Mm -hmm. But then there was nothing for the other people to respond to. And, but I'm still happy I tried it. Right. Yeah, the, the creating the questions is really um, the tricky part. I mean, I struggle with that even, you know, working with adults who, you, you know, really want to try to respond and give thorough, thoughtful responses and keep the discussion going. And then sometimes it just, you know, just stops. <laughs> there's there's not nothing else left to add or to say. Um, and so that can, can anybody hear me now? Oh, yes, boy, we can I think hear you. Oh, man, that was so <laughs> lonesome. I was just about to cry. She's still good to be back. Golly. 
Okay, <laughs> well, I had, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, was, I was starting to answer the questions that you guys posted on this chart, on this discussion chart. Um, how do I assess my discussion boards? The first thing I was going to say about that is that I make my criteria very specific. Um, and and what, I, what I mostly want is, as I express to the kids, you know, a lot of the learning is going to happen between you guys. I'm just going to kind of pitch some things out there for you to think about. And and usually the, the, the most important questions I want pitched at them become their homework assignments. And then after they complete the assignment and submit it to me, they need to post, say, if there was three questions they had for homework, I want them to post on the discussion board the response they provided to me, which is most meaningful to them and the one that they are most anxious to have peers respond to. So up that goes. And then I give the kids very specific criteria what I'm looking for with a discussion response. And that means I'm going to just tell them, but I'm also going to provide them an example or two of what would work well. And I'm going to provide them some examples or two of what does not work for me. And so uh, they're really going to, I think when you're forming concepts, I learned this long ago in critical thinking, you got to offer examples and non-examples so kids can see like, oh, well, there, that's what's wrong with mine. And, uh, and even after I give them criteria and some examples and non-examples, it's still possible that they're going to post something that's a little bit uh, brief or a little shallow or uh, that, that won't meet my hopes. And then I, you know, um, I get, I give feedback to them on that as well and, and kind of coach them up. It doesn't take long uh, if my, uh, if my examples are good. Um, so my assessment is simply whether or not they've met the criteria. And I certainly don't need to agree with, with the opinions that they share with each other so long as they uh, do it with the format that I'm asking them to do. And, and so how do, uh, is there a question about that before I go to the second uh, question uh, about engagement? What are some of the things that you put on your criteria? OK. Um, uh, who is that? Was that uh, Kimberly? Suzanne. Oh, Suzanne. Did, Su mm -hmm. You saw my, uh, I asked her first too, and I didn't hear you guys respond, but uh, did you guys all watch my short uh, screencast on uh, the transformative power of online discussions? I did. I did not get to finish that, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, on there, on there, I suggest a, uh, my most important criteria for online discussions is that uh, my response to my peer has to do more than affirm them. I am just not interested in good job, Debbie, that was great. I agree with everything you said. What am I going to add to the thread? So that means, in, in my case, I give them a, a plus minus plus uh, technology. That means that oh, they I did, start with I an app. I see that. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. They start with I a did. very specific affirmation, not, oh, that's great, but I, I especially liked your insight about X or Y. That was very interesting to me. And then the minus is not really such a minus, but it's a challenge. Um, I have to add something. So my, my encouragement for them is to challenge their peer to think about it differently. Um, I have another example you never mentioned, Debbie, or, um, you know, uh, here's an exception to the rule. I wonder what you think about this. Uh, so something to kind of startle the, the original poster to think like, oh, okay, wait a minute. I guess I didn't have the whole thing figured out on my first try. My peer is offering me another perspective that I didn't think about. And then after that, after that challenge, um, a closing affirmation needs to be visible. So we're bookending a challenge to think differently or think more broadly. Um, with positive affirmations. And that, just by itself, gets kids so grateful to hear some input um, that uh, they don't seem to get defensive. And so if I hear a challenge, or if I just hear affirmation and I don't see the challenge and the added value, then they don't get their full credit. That's, this, uh, that's my simple answer to uh, how I, how I uh, assess it. Um, I don't. I don't offer the kind of points on my discussion board that I do for my written assignments. Um, if my written assignment was worth 10, the discussion afterwards about it 
um, might only be worth three. Or if I say, I want you to respond to two different peers about this, and I'll talk about how I, how I group those later. But if I say that, I might only offer two points for each of those responses. Now, if a kid gets a word back from me that I only gave them one out of two points on, their, on one of their responses, that startles them. And they're like, Whoa, what? And so I say, you know, I, I see your affirmation, but I didn't see the value added. I didn't see your challenge. And uh, so uh, thanks for the affirmation. But next time, include a challenge too. And the next time, you will see it. They don't like losing a point. They really uh, are motivated by that. Even though it's not a substantial amount of points, um, they might argue it's awfully subjective or something. Uh, it is enough to shape their behavior. Uh, I get uh, a lot of response to that. Uh, and if it's great, and if what they're doing is just follow my criteria right away, I just say, so good. Thanks, uh, Anna, for, uh, uh, for nailing this plus minus plus, you know. Uh, but she'll see the two points for each answer, and she'll know that she's doing it well. Um, so the other, qu the next question was, how do I engage students effectively and have students move beyond this minimum response? Well, that I, I think I just answered with the value-added responses. And for me, I just like the technology of plus minus plus. It it makes it warm and fuzzy to challenge each other. It's not it's contentious, or uh, it, kids don't tend to get defensive. And I think there's some intellectual humility in it, too. I, I don't say, oh, uh, Kimberly, you know, uh, I like your idea, but uh, ultimately it's confused. I say with humility, hey, that's an interesting insight. Thanks for that. I was thinking of it another whole way. I wonder uh, what you think about that. So uh, I'm offering it with some civility and some intellectual humility. Or just an idea. Maybe you would think of, you would include this as another example or as an exception to the rule or something like that. Um, so the third question on the chart was, how do we incorporate discussion boards smoothly without taking class time? That was very interesting to me. Who wants a discussion that doesn't take class time? That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, uh, every discussion I've ever had takes class time, especially the discretionary ones in which I say, who knows the answer to this one, you know, and a hand or two goes up and three or four kids are yawning and some others are doing their math, right? Um, so this, uh, this question deserves to be asked of all classroom discussion time. Uh, and I think if it's well orchestrated, the time is rich. Um, one could ask, how can I impart information to my students without taking up class time? And that would be an exciting question for me. Uh, at the Jesuit Technology Conference a couple of years ago, I went to New Orleans. One person stood up and said, can we agree that there is no reason to invite 25 kids to sit in our room to impart information on them that they can get at home? Uh, and I thought, oh, wow, there's, there's the essence of a flipped classroom. Let's have them get the information at home or on their own, and let's invite them here in the class to, to work on it or to create something with it together. Um, hopefully, discussion time takes class time. Um, I would like to think so. Uh, anybody want to remark about that or ask me something about that? I think that wasn't me posed to that, but it's something I thought about. This is Kimberly, by the way, because um, I, I, I wonder what they're, I don't know, if an outsider walked into the room and there's a bunch of kids on their iPads typing away and they're engaged in this discussion, what does that look like to the outsider where, versus me engaging them in a discussion or them in small groups engaged in a discussion? I like get the whole concept. I do. It's just a, it's just a thought that I have. It is a little it is a little different. Here's another uh, here's another example of, of a kind of a prehistoric online discussion that I used to use in my classroom. I would I would put put a question of some sort for kids to or maybe we just watched a film together or, or who knows what happened. We had some sort of an absorb activity which kind of like you know put something new in their head, and I asked everybody to write for ten minutes. As soon as that time, that writing time was over, I asked them to stand up and walk around the room and sit at a new chair. And as they sat in a new chair, they're looking down at what somebody else produced as a response to the same film or short story or whatever it was that we just read together. 
Now they're going to read that and they're going to respond to that. And so right. I give another mm -hmm. 10 minutes. And so everybody kind of, you know, has some time. And then, and so now I say, stand up again, <laughs> travel, either travel back to your own seat or take a third chair that you had not been. And now you're going to see a thread going on here. We've all watched this film. You've seen the first person's post, a second person's response to it. Having read all of that, what do you have to say about the thread that has developed? Um, and so there's another five minutes of writing time. Now we're going to go back to our seats and enjoy what's happened at our desk while we were gone, right? Mm -hmm. I have produced something and I've had a peer read it and respond to me thoughtfully. Another peer looked at that conversation and responded. And so now that would take 25 minutes or so. It's I used to call it a bulletin, a bulletin board discussion. But I think that same kind of thing is really what's happening here mm -hmm. um, with our iPads now. It's just in a new era. Right. Right. Good. I like that. Yeah. Good analogy. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if we just if we just want to sit around the room and say, oh, who thinks this about what, you know, and some kid answers and anybody want to say something about that? Well, maybe I do and maybe I don't. What I hated about that time. <laughs> was that none of those were mandate questions. You can answer if you want to. You can yawn if you want to. You can fall asleep if you want to. But it's discretionary. If you're in the mood to say something, do so. And so a mandate question, which is the only kind really I, I like in a classroom anyway, is one that everybody has to answer. So even if it's a basic question, what do you think is going to happen next? Before you raise your hand, tell the person sitting right next to you what you think will happen next. So everybody in the room is going to answer the question, no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, uh, another thing I like about these virtual discussions is everybody is assigned X number of peers to respond to. Um, so how do I get a sense of the effort was the next question on this chart. Um, well, how do you get a sense of the effort in an oral discussion? Uh, I, th I think that's very difficult. Um, I think perhaps it's easier if I can if I can look down at it, um, if I can if I can review and, and watch. I, I I can see if somebody's being a little brief. And, and the way that I can I can spot brevity and and somebody's in a hurry is they affirm the other peers without detail. Hey, I really like what you said. And moving on. Here's something to think about. I'm going to say, wait, 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 Johnny. You said you really liked what she said. What are you talking about? Where is your specific example? And, it, you know, so unless he's going to say, you know, what you said about this character's growth or this character learning, that was very insightful to me. Then I know that their effort is there. Uh, I see if I see brevity or, or, you know, vagueness, I know that the effort is not there. That would just be my answer about how do I know how sincere or, or, or what effort. Um, somebody asked if I could prove, if I have a way, you know, another concern people had is these online discussions. How do you know they're actually doing their own work? Well, you know, the students are connected by their email accounts. And, and I think for this to be some other student writing a response to a peer, she'd have to have her friends sitting right next to her in her bedroom or something. And I don't know what the trouble would be worth for three points. I'm also not sure that students aren't having each other write each other's papers that are worth 50 points, is what I said on this on this document here. Um, I don't think that an online discussion runs any more risk of cheating than uh, any other activity we do in schools in which we bring our work from home. Um, I think also and how, you have to weigh again, going back to how you said it, the fact that your discussions aren't, you know, weighted the same as, as a, a paper or, um, you know, a test or, or an, a, a bigger assignment. They're, they're there for students to reflect and to really dig deeper, analyze, um, you know, synthesize the information and the questions that are brought up into the course, and maybe not necessarily for heavy graded points, but rather I want to see how right. the students are thinking. Are they processing the information? And yes, there's some points attached because we know students probably won't do things if there's not something there's not some you know uh, incentive attached to it um, but it shouldn't be 
I think, um, in my opinion, you know, a, a big bulk of your grade. And, and I was talking earlier and realized that my mic was off. In regards to taking up class time, you know, I think that um, uh, idea, in my mind, the way discussion boards should work, uh, which is different than a back channel, is that the discussion happens offline or online outside of class. And then you as a teacher can pick out some highlights of what students have said and then bring that into class, into the actual classroom discussion and say, hey, Johnny, I really liked it, you know, when you mentioned that X, Y, and Z, and can you expand a little bit more on that or, you know, that kind of a thing and, and bringing what they've done outside of class into the classroom um, via the discussion board. So. That's interesting, too. Yeah, and then the in-class time could be used for to produce something or to collaborate or something like that. Um, yeah, I like that. I do. Um, on the on the idea of how much points can we give to the oral participation of kids in class, boy, is that an ancient discussion. Parents will say, oh, you know, my kid's kind of an introvert, blah, 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 blah. Well, <clears throat> we've gone to some length to try to create a meaningful graded uh, discussion at the start of every year just on the summer readings that kids had to do, and it was quite a chore. Um, we were grooming student leaders to ask good questions. We would give uh, students in a circle of about 10 or 12 of them each three cards of a different color. And they uh, each time they want to raise their hand and say something, they turn in their first card. Everybody goes white before we let anybody use a red card and that kind of a thing. And then as they hand their card to us while they're talking to each other, the teacher jots down one, two, or three. A, a, a one is a home run answer that was detailed and rooted in the text. A two is a kind of an interesting answer, which would maybe is not rooted in the text, and a, and a three, or vice versa, I guess three points would be the highest, um, would be a, a one then would be would be a just kind of, a, oh, I totally agree, blah, 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 which didn't necessarily take any academic effort. That orchestration, that, that big project uh, takes a lot of energy, and I'm not sure the ultimate product is any better than the kind of things that I have showing up each time I ask a student to respond to two peers, uh, and and I or or to or to each of the three peers in their group of four, uh, for example, um, somebody asked a question earlier. How do I make sure they don't just talk to their friends? Well, um, you group them, and you can change the groups, but the assignment is probably for uh, for the for the night's discussion uh, to respond to the three other people who are in your group. Um, and uh, so, anyway, as I said in my little presentation, sometimes I let them go outside of group, but I like for a little intimacy to develop over a course time, too, um, especially uh, for, for some of the more intimate conversations that we get in the theology class, faith-related things, for example, like that. They like to have their group that's been the same group they've gone to for a number of times. Do you ever let them talk between sections? Um, you mean cross-pollinate? Sort of of, yeah, uh, perhaps <clears throat> there should be time for that too. Yeah, I don't think you would do that necessarily when you're doing your virtual discussion. If you're doing a virtual discussion and you're trying to imagine, would there ever be time inside the classroom for me to have kids discuss this thing with each other uh, online? Um, I think it would, it would be more like the bulletin board discussion with better technology that I just described earlier. Um, I like uh, what I think it was Kimberly that just said. She imagines uh, some of her discussions being things that they do at home, and then some of the highlights for that could be brought back to the class the next day. That could that could also be the case. But well, that's what I, what I mean, like outside yeah. of class, because you have section one talking with a oh. group from section two. Oh, Cause they, maybe. Because they're not, in, yeah, they couldn't do it simultaneously because they're not in class at the same time. But mm -hmm. outside of oh. class, two different sections of the same class could. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. My first period class could speak to my third period class or something. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, sure they could. Because, you know, yeah, different classes so. have different perspectives on things. You know, one class might really oh. be enjoying a book and another class, they might be grumbling. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you have the technology to network your two classes and let them access each other on a discussion board. If they're on a Moodle class, 
for example, mm -hmm. only the people in that class would be uh, available to them unless you somehow bunch the whole Moodle uh, community together. I hadn't right. thought of that. That's interesting. That's a good question, though, for the IT guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say is that the thing that I value about the online discussions that that I've sort of promoted in this screencast is that the quality, the substance of the exchange is very different from the kind of things that happen spontaneously in a classroom, which uh, do not necessarily require any pre-thought or any pre-writing and do not have necessarily any structure required on the response. And so the, uh, the plus minus plus thing has just really been a powerful tool uh, to make these meaningful. And one of my favorite colleagues in my high school was such a great advocate of intimate classroom discussion, was a perennial naysayer with virtual discussions. He said, no way, this is not going to be intimate. It will not be warm. It's sterile. It's technical. It's, kids have too much of this already. And I have to say, while I respect that, the exchange depth that, that you can get with these virtual discussions surpasses the depth and the detail that you get in the classroom because kids have time to think before they speak. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it should, it at least deserves a place um, among classroom discussions for that reason. Poor uh, Jim can't even speak. I wonder if you have any questions, Jim. Are we <laughs> ignoring you? Are you feeling lonely like I was? Nope. <laughs> You're okay. Um, I see that Jasmine is advancing my uh, my slide a little bit. I, I did uh, suggest this is a little PowerPoint that I have my kids watch before uh, um, before they do their discussions and, and I do like to give them some non-examples so this, this is what I meant by that please don't do this good job Mary I totally agree with everything you're saying here it just doesn't help Mary at all um, specific affirmations without added value also don't help um, and then disagreements or challenges without affirmation get a little kind of contentious and we really want to look forward to going to the discussion room for things and and uh, I mean, I get kids saying, hey, that's such a great idea. Thanks so much. I never thought of that before. Um, whereas in the classroom, it just gets hot and contentious sometimes if, because kids aren't thinking about affirming first, you know, offering a humble suggestion and then affirming at the end. So, um, yeah. So I don't know which slide that was. That was probably page four. Um I feel embarrassed to have talked so much and not listened more. I, I was uh, enjoying my incognito time of hearing you guys when you couldn't hear me. That was interesting. <laughs> well, could you um, share with us, um, Tim, maybe uh, an example question that you might, um, that you pose to students that, that has worked really well or... Um... Well, okay. Uh, yes, in bioethics, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, topics where we're just talking about ethics in general at the start is a, is a sad story about Kitty Genovese who is a woman who was uh, raped and murdered outside her apartment complex in Brooklyn a couple of decades ago and the weird thing about the story was the neighbors all were peeking out their windows and they all reported hearing about it and they all looked out their doors the, the assault actually went inside the apartment and continued in the lobby no neighbor ever phoned the police or ever came outside their door they're all frightened to death and so the question for the kids was do you believe the people in kitty's apartment complex should have been legally required to do something is it a criminal offense to ignore our neighbor when we could do something with no risk to ourselves it's an interesting ethical dilemma. So the kids all, you know, very energetically post their opinion about that. And so uh, that's the homework question. That's not a discussion question. The discussion happens once everybody posts their response to the Kitty Genovese story and everybody else has to read what the, their peers said and respond to them. And the response has to have uh, an affirmation of detail they appreciate, another perspective they were not thinking of, 
and a closing affirmation. And so, uh, Ooh. I bet those were some you know, interesting comments. Oh, you know, everything. And we're going to talk about euthanasia next. And gee, somebody's grandma is living in their home right now. And we talk about abortion and some kids got his, his sister and her baby living in their house. And it's like, you know, um, these are very, very big, relevant personal topics and we don't want to boot them around with any kind of a you know it's not like a math question no uh, offense to math teachers it's, it's a different kind of discussion here we really have to protect the environment with with uh, sensitive you know humble sharing of opinions and a, and a lot of affirmation so everybody knows that they're that they're it's safe for them to say what they think and and if they get challenged it's going to be uh, you know um, a warm fuzzy one you know, so it's it's just critical that I coach up the style of interaction with kids in these kind of conversations or, or nothing, you know, really meaningful will happen. And so that's a little bit different, I realize, than uh, who says Huck Finn did the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, that can be good, too, but it's a little bit less personal, um, less volatile or vulnerable, I guess I would say. And I mean, I love the point that you made to me about creating that safe environment. I think sometimes we realize that we have to create that in the online space as well when we're oh, talking yeah. about sort of like the blended teacher that, well, it's safe in my classroom, but then, you know, when you get online, some people do feel safer and some don't. You know, maybe they've been victims of cyberbullying or they just don't feel uh, as confident to put their, their selves out there in that way because, you know, fear of being attacked and internet trolls and, and all of that kind of a thing. So um, yeah. I think it's important that, that we, like you said, sort of build up and, and create that safe environment online as well as as well as well in the classroom. Um, and, and so, you know, being sure that you do that early on. And, and like you said, the, the affirmations, I think, is, is really helpful. And, and I struggled with that a lot as, as a theater and speech teacher when I had students give each other feedback on presentations or performances and um, creating an effective system that allowed students to to be critical of each other's work, but in a respectful, um, right. kind way, you know. Right. Are there thoughts or questions about anything? Well, mostly I think the fear as everybody moves toward a, a more of a blended and virtual classroom is that we're going to lose something vital. We're going to lose some warmth and so on. And we don't want to romanticize what's happened in classrooms is not always warm. And we do want to admit, though, that it's going to take some very deliberate criteria and some coaching and some supervision by teachers to cultivate that online. But I know for a fact that it's very possible. And uh, uh, so I'm eager to eager to explain that and to show my examples if anybody says, no, nope, no, nope, you can't do it. You just can't have a good discussion online. And so uh, it's a nice tool to have. Mm -hmm. If I was ever going to be back in a classroom again, I would certainly want to have uh, the technology to do some of these discussions as well as the old fashioned stuff. So, so Tim says that he struggles with tying in good online discussion to a science classroom. Um, and mm. my my first reaction to that, my first thought, which I wanted I meant to mention earlier as well, is um, and I you know and I've read with some of the things you know that I, that I've shared with you all for this week is um, the more ownership students can take of the discussion, um, the better the discussion will be. Um, so the the more connected they feel to it, the more um, it's relevant to them. I think the more um, engaged they'll be with it, um, and I think. Uh, one of the, the the big ideas that comes up in the early readings for this week was that, you know, not posing yes or no questions or, you know, there is going to be one right answer, but I wonder if in science you can ask about, you know, describe how you might um, conduct this experiment or, or find a hypothesis to this, et cetera, or bringing in, um, you know, sort of the, the real world or, or in the news, science in the news kind of type questions um, that maybe they could discuss and talk about. Um, online as well as in the classroom. I'm not sure if that's something you thought about or, or considered. I think yeah, I like that to... answer. Oh, sorry. And oh, I'd, no, I'd, okay. ask, I'd like to ask Jim too, do you struggle finding a good in-class discussion 
in science. And, and I wonder uh, if that's an easy yes, um, why it wouldn't be just as good uh, uh, online. Is there something different about the online environment uh, that would want to change the question? Uh, certainly, as, uh, as was just said, you know, questions about stem cell, you know, research could be in the classroom and then a, an, an editorial about it um, could be discussed online, but I suppose that would just be the same in the class. I don't know. I'm not a big science guy, so I don't know what kinds of great, great questions they would have there. I think the ethical questions, those make sense. And for me, that's easy because teaching biology, so I can always find an yeah. ethical question to you get bet. them to talk. But maybe in chemistry, that's not necessarily as easy. But the um, Jasmine mentioned something that made me think about the inquiry question is um, like the standards are trying to get us to go towards more inquiry and argumentative science. So maybe trying to frame around around that and and not the cookbook experiment, but hey, what what is the hypothesis for this? What could be a hypothesis? How would you change it? Or do an experiment and what would you do next? And what would it look like? You you could have that might be a good place for conversation and discussion online or in class. Mhm. Mm I think too with my limited knowledge of chemistry, but if you know, you know, online there's also just as many things like as Tim has mentioned that you can do online as you can do in person. And thinking if you posted a, a video, uh, maybe a few minutes of, of an experiment or something happening, an equation, and then it pauses right at the, you know, or you you, you don't show them the whole video and and asking them, you know, what could happen next or what should happen next or what might happen next or how would you solve this um, different ways that kind of a thing, um, you know, might lead to interesting discussion, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant about what kinds of great discussions go on in a science classroom. I shouldn't be. I'm not proud of that. But uh, in the math, it's the same kind of thing, unless it was applications, you know. Um, the, they would be just as good virtual as in the classroom. Mm -hmm. mm. Good. And we have just a yeah. few more minutes. Any um, last questions for, for Tim about discussion boards, about online mm -hmm. communication in general, or things that from the this week or last week that we haven't gotten to yet that you're wanting to share or ask about? All right. I'll take that. I appreciate it. We'll think of them idea. after we're not, <laughs> not online <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You can always email me uh, or, uh, or Tim. Um, yes, uh, so again, thank you all uh, for, for joining us. Um, just very briefly, um, you'll still hear from me throughout this week. Um, if you have any questions, you know, you can, you can email me or ask them on, on the news forum or the questions uh, discussion board um, on our classroom uh, if, and on our course online. If you can't access something, please let me know ASAP so that I can, uh, you know, make sure that, it, that it's working for everyone. Um, and that you have access to everything. Um, thank you all uh, for joining us this evening. I know it's late in some parts of the world, so I won't uh, keep you too much longer. If you have any questions, email us. I will. Is it okay, Tim, if I send them your email address if they have questions yes, later? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Great, great, good. So, um, so I'll do that. I'll share that with them. Um, and I will see you or hear from you all uh, next week, same time, same platform. Um, and let me know in the meantime if you if you need anything at all. And for those of you that submitted last week's assignment, I'm still I'm working through those, so just be patient with me as well. And but I will get um get, give you feedback on that. So thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys. Good Have night, a great everybody. Day. And the session Good is night. recorded, so I will I will post it online shortly. Right. Terrific. Good night. Thank you so much.